Boa tarde. Obrigado a todos e a todas pela presença aqui nesta aula inaugural e vamos então dar aqui início. Uh, and so, uh, to start uh, our uh, inaugural lecture of the uh, doctoral programs of the Center for Social Studies here at the University of Coimbra, uh, start by welcoming all uh, and of course to thanking uh, Baruz Bushani for your presence here with us and uh, it's, uh, it will certainly be, uh, I hope, an inspiring talk and also particularly inspiring for much of the work that is being done here at doctoral level, but also I'm sure that we have uh, also students from other uh, uh, cycles uh, of study. Uh, and uh, I also take the opportunity in particular to greet here my colleague, uh, also a researcher from the Center for Social Studies, but who is here as Vice Director of the School of Economics, uh, Professor Madalena Duarte, for hosting this lecture and of course for all the cooperation in the doctoral programs that SESH has with the School of Economics. Uh, and also take the opportunity to greet uh, the director of the School of uh, Arts and Humanities or the School of Letters of the University of Coimbra uh, and also of the Interdisciplinary Institute uh, of Research of the University of Coimbra, also uh, units at the university with whom uh, uh, the Center for Social Studies has uh, uh, collaboration in doctoral programs and of course that's uh, uh, under the overarching uh, uh, um, uh, rule of the University of Coimbra and also take the opportunity to greet here uh, Professor Paul Peixoto who is here as pro-rector in representation of the rector uh, of the University of Coimbra. But of course I think the, the, the main, uh, the main uh, greetings that we have to, to leave today is to the students uh, and it is uh, uh, here the doctoral programs uh, are not only directed for the students but are also animated by the students and by the work of the students and the research that you are producing and that's the overall uh, primary objective uh, of these inaugural lectures. The inaugural lectures have been uh, a high point uh, yearly of the uh, hosting uh, uh, week uh, of the um, SESH uh, doctoral programs and uh, we have varied in terms of themes across the different uh, uh, thematic doctoral programs that we have, uh, that we have uh, at SESH. There are currently 12 doctoral programs uh, across uh, different themes. Uh, and in particular, I think this year, I think it's uh, important to note uh, the five programs that have received new students uh, 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 that are entering the doctoral program this year, in particular the cities and urban cultures, cultures doctoral program, the political economy interdisciplinary doctorate, the feminist studies program, the human rights and contemporary societies, and the program on work relations, social inequalities, and trade unionism. And so these are the five programs that uh, have received new students uh, this year. And uh, as, as most of the programs start uh, act uh, uh, on a biennial uh, program, and so every two years we have uh, new students. And so as you see, uh, we have a kind of a, a wide range uh, of studies here uh, at the Center for Social Studies. Uh, I think it's also particularly interesting uh, the, the talk that we have this year and uh, as, as mentioned before we have uh, had a variety of themes and focus and invitees uh, for the, the inaugural lecture. And uh, Bruce Bouchani, as you see also uh, from the title of his lecture, Writing as an Act of Resistance to Colonial Violence from Iran to Australia, I think uh, and uh, brings here uh, a mark that is also uh, I think uh, important uh, in what the work that we do uh, in our research at the center but also with the students in the doctoral programs in the articulation between academic work uh, uh, and, uh, um, and, and the experience of different actors. And here we'll have uh, 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 very much a personal voice uh, of the experience, uh, uh, one, of colonial violence, two of uh, migration experiences. And I think uh, uh, our colleague Marisa Gonçalves will introduce uh, Beruz Bouchani uh, in more detail, but I think it's important to take that note. Uh, 
uh, also uh, a second note, and uh, I think it might also be uh, might also come in your talk, uh, which is the, the, the interdisciplinary dialogue that we have in much of our programs. And uh, as you've mentioned to us in the, during during lunchtime. Uh, that much of your work has also been uh, uh, in important dialogue with the arts. And uh, uh, Bruce has been uh, particularly um, well known or became more visible uh, because, uh, not just because of the experience, of your experience, but also because of the way uh, you shared your experience in writing. And of course, writing is in your talk, in the title of your talk, but you've also experienced with other artistic, um, uh, uh, artistic uh, 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 modes. And I think these dialogues, of course, here it's, uh, uh, it's not just about interdisciplinary academic dialogue, but it's also about different forms uh, of expression uh, that also can uh, contribute to the way that we understand our academic work and the way that we explore uh, a certain particular uh, concepts or certain particular political experiences. And um, without taking uh, further time uh, from, uh, um, uh, from this session, uh, I thank you again for the presence uh, and uh, look forward for your talk. Uh, and I pass uh, Edward uh, on to Madalena Vart. Thank you so much, Tiago. Um, it is my honor to welcome Professor Beruz Bouchani to FILC and to this inaugural lecture of the SESH doctoral programs. Um, I would also like to greet the Pro-Rector Professor Paul Peixot, the Director of FLUC, Professor Albano, the President of the Scientific Board of SESH, um, and of course to, I would like also to greet the Director of Center for Social Studies, Tiago Santos Pereira, and also Marisa Ramos Gonçalves, who will introduce our guest. Special greetings also to all the audience, uh, especially to all the students and colleagues that are present here today. The inaugural lecture of the SES doctoral programs is always a very special academic moment. Um, first of all, because uh, it is an opportunity to reaffirm the excellent cooperation that the Faculty of Economics has with SESH. This cooperation uh, has existed since the very beginning of SESH. FIUC is a multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary school. Um, it was created in 1972. We are now celebrating our 50th anniversary. FIUC is also very committed to deepening global and critical perspectives on the great problems of our time and the doctoral programs we have in cooperation with SESH are an expression of this commitment. We have about nine doctoral programs in cooperation with SESH with students from more than 50 countries, many from the global south. And this diversity, this cultural diversity, uh, contributes to a significant and important sharing of experiences and personal narratives that enriches the knowledge of all of us. The inaugural lecture is also a very important moment because of the boldness and extreme relevance of the themes that are addressed by highly prestigious lecturers contributing to the development of critical thinking and to the dialogue between scientific knowledge and the knowledge produced by citizens, activists and social movements all over the world. So we will certainly benefit greatly from Professor Bouchani's lecture, given his personal testimony, his biographical and critical analysis of such urgent questions as border and colonial violence new migration policies, and resistance, namely creative resistance. It is a privilege, Professor Bouchani, to be able to listen to you in person after reading you in No Friend But the Mountains. I won't take uh, up any more of your time. I just want to conclude to, uh, by addressing students, the students present here, and wish you all an excellent academic journey. Thank you so much. 
Good afternoon. I would also like to thank um, the director of SAGE and the vice director of FILC uh, and all the, the students here today and colleagues uh, for, for being here uh, and welcoming Berus Bushani who came a long way across oceans uh, to, to uh, share his experiences and knowledge with us. Uh, it is a very happy moment, so thanks for, for coming. Uh, I will present uh, Berus Bushani uh, uh, now, so he is a Kurdish Iranian writer, journalist, a scholar, cultural advocate, and filmmaker. He is an adjunct associate professor in social sciences at the University of New South Wales in Australia. Graduated from Tarviat Mohalem University and Tarviat Modales University, both in Tehran, Iran. He holds a master's degree in political science, political geography, and geopolitics. Furthermore, he is a non-resident visiting scholar at the Sydney Asia Pacific Migration Centre, an honorary member of PEN International and the winner of the Amnesty International Australia uh, Media Award in 2017. Uh, the Diaspora Symposium Social Justice Award, the Liberty Victoria 2018 Empty Chair Award and the uh, Annapolitovskaya Award for Journalism. Berus wrote the book No Friend uh, But the Mountains, uh, which is translated uh, to Portuguese by Casa das Letras with the title Sozinho nas Montanhas, and which you can find in the library uh, North Sul uh, at Sej. Uh, and for this book, he won the prestigious Australian 2019 Victorian Prize for Literature, uh, in addition to the non-fiction category of the book. In 2022, uh, with the editors on Mitofigian and Moon Mansubi, he published uh, Freedom, Only Freedom, The Prison Writings of Verus Bushani, that features his collected writings and essays from experts on migration and refugee rights. Verus is also co-director with Arash Kamali Sarvastani of the 2017 feature-length film Shoka, Please Tell Us the Time. The time. The documentary is about the situation in the immigration detention center uh, in, where he was uh, in Manus Island, but it also functions as a critique of the system, the culture and ideology that underline, underlies uh, uh, Western liberal democracies and their militarized and securitized, securitized border regimes. Uh, Berus has been a contributor to newspapers such as The Guardian, The Saturday Paper, uh, The Financial Times, and The Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, and his writings, films, academic articles, activist work reflect his life experience of being a political prisoner incarcerated by the Australian government in Papua New Guinea for nearly seven years but also his resistance to persecution as a member of the Kurdish minority living in Iran. Uh, in 2013, after arriving in Australian waters and seeking asylum by boat from Indonesia, Beruz was initially detained on Christmas Island, which is an Australian territory. Shortly after, he was exiled to Manus Island Immigration Detention Center in Papua New Guinea, where he witnessed and experienced a systematic torture of refugees banished by the Australian government. And he will talk in depth about this uh, uh, just now. Um, in November 2019, Berus finally escaped to New Zealand, and the next year he was granted political asylum, uh, where he now lives in Wellington. Uh, during this period, through collaboration, consultation, and sharing of knowledge, uh, Berus, while imprisoned in Manus, uh, and Iranian-Australian academic Amit Tofigian, who lived in Sydney, developed a key theoretical framework that analyzes the Australian border regime, which they named as Manus Prison Theory. This framework explores the, the colonial logic underlying border violence. In the particular case of Australia, um, they argue that its colonial history and systemic racism are the basis for the Australian government refugee policies uh, across the political spectrum. Berus and Omid combined theory and intellectual vision based on refugees' lived experience and their artistic expressions into the work of knowledge production. Uh, and I think this is a, a central argument, a central point that they are producing knowledge, uh, and this is why we also invited Berus to come here. It is central to their argument that refugees are not just there to be helped, 
uh, but above all, it, it is their humanity that needs to be uh, recognized. So without further ado, I give the floor to Veruz, uh, who came a long way to, to uh, talk with us here. And it's an honor to have you uh, and we'll listen yeah. to you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, very happy to be here. Actually, I came from a very long journey. Uh, uh, 17 hours from Auckland, New Zealand to Dubai, and then 8 hours to Lisbon. So it's a very <laughs> long journey. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me. Uh, I think it's very important that, uh, you know, last year I visited Europe, and I've seen that how Australia is becoming like an example for many countries uh, and you know some countries that I visited they were uh, considering Australia as an example and we know that in UK uh, they exactly follow uh, Australian example and it's quite interesting they use the same language uh, like the way they say to stop the boat or they call people about people. Uh, so it's like an example for uh, many countries, especially UK, that they are uh, sending refugees to Rwanda. And also in uh, Denmark, it's quite interesting that on 2016, uh, I remember that some Danish politicians visited Nauru Island and visited the prison camps there uh, to look at it, look at the possibility of uh, that example and they did it. So Denmark is one of the countries that now has these uh, offshore prisons. So I think it's very important in Europe uh, uh, that we understand what Australia has done and what can we learn from Australia. Uh, so, the, just I think it's important that first I say something about myself because uh, my background as a court uh, I think has impact on my work that I did in Manus Island. Uh, I, uh, born in the middle of a war between Iraq and Iran, and that war actually happened on uh, mostly in Kurdistan land, because Kurdistan is a land that is divided between four countries, so I should quote uh, one of Kurdish novelists, uh, Sherzad Hassan, that he has an interesting description of Kurdistan. He said Kurdistan is like a garden that the neighbor elephant, when they want to fight each other, they fight in that garden. Mm -hmm. And even when they want to make love, they do it on that garden. So in the end, in, uh, Kurdistan is destroyed. So that is the... <laughs> I think it's a very uh, interesting description of Kurdistan. So I was born in, on that time, in the middle of that war, and uh, I was raised in that war, and later I uh, accepted by university in Tehran, and I went to move to Tehran. But it's really important as a Kurd uh, that we know that Kurdish language uh, is uh, not a formal language in Iran. It's not recognized as an official language. And we have been, alongside other ethnic minorities, we have been struggling uh, against uh, that, uh, like we call it Persian supremacy, uh, for many years. And I think that is a big problem in Iran. But in Iran, unfortunately, they don't want to talk about it. So I raised in that place. And uh, the reason I left Iran was exactly because of Kurdish language, because I and some of my colleagues, we, uh, in my city, we were uh, in Kurdistan. 
we were trying to uh, educate and teach our people that how it's important that we keep the Kurdish language alive. And in the end, uh, they attacked our office and arrested some of my colleagues. So that is the general, you know, picture about uh, my story. Uh, so what's happened on May 2013, I left Iran and I went to Indonesia. So I am going to use my story as one of many stories just to that you have an image about the, uh, you know, that part of the world where refugees go and the way they go and how they get in the boat. I think it's important that we have that image. So if we have, yeah. Uh, so refugees actually from uh, like uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan, in those countries and even some from Vietnam, they mostly uh, come to uh, uh, Indonesia. So most of them, so they come to Indonesia and from there, they have two ways to reach to Australia. So one of them, I don't know that you hear me or not. <laughs> yeah, just a bit. Yes, yeah, so what they do, they uh, come getting the boat, come to Christmas Island. That is Christmas Island, which is an island belong to Australia. It's very, like, uh, the distance is very short. So in, like, uh, 48 hours by boat, the refugees reach to that place and they seek asylum. Or they uh, go to Darwin here. And uh, this way that they go is much is a long way, but is uh, more safer, you know, because of the water. The ocean is not uh, like wide here. So, but most of refugees prefer to go to Christmas Island because it's shorter, so they can, uh, yeah. So what's happened, so when they go there and seek asylum, or in Darwin, so according to like a international convention that Australia is committed, they should process them. So what's happened, uh, I got in the boat with a group of refugees and we went to Christmas Island. So I left Indonesia on, uh, to, uh, on 17 uh, July 2013. And it was supposed that we arrived in like 48 hours, but uh, our boat was uh, lost and we arrived in uh, 23 July. And when we arrived there in Christmas Island, they uh, say that we already announced a policy that according to this policy, they call it 19 July policy, uh, we banish you to Manus Island and Nauru Island. So you should live there forever. So that means that when we were on the ocean, we didn't know about this policy. So it was like a, they took us as the hostages. Uh, so the refugees who came after 19 July, they were like about 3,500 people. And they banished us to, uh, so that is Christmas Island, so we didn't reach to Australia, they didn't let us. They just uh, put us in a plane and they sent us to Manus Island, in north of Papua New Guinea, here. But they sent uh, from here, it's like nine hours by plane, that uh, they send men, only single men, Manus Island, so we were uh, like uh, 900 men, single men, and uh, they send uh, uh, refugees, like the single woman or the families and children, they send them to Nauru, here is Nauru. So Australia has two uh, detention, Manus Island, which is an island, is belong to Papua New Guinea, 
And Nauru Island, which is an independent country, but is the most the smallest republic in, on the earth. They are just like 9,000 population. And in, in Manus Island, uh, uh, the population is like 40,000 people, but most of them live in the forest uh, because it's a, just a tropical area. So in uh, Nauru, they kept uh, uh, children, women, and families and manus like that. So according to that policy, they say that we, uh, uh, you never get into Australia. That was the policy and so then they started to, the boats who were still coming to Australia, they, uh, after a while, they started to send them back to Indonesia. Uh, or some of them, they just send them to Manus and Nauru. So that is the whole uh, image about, uh, you know, the way that uh, refugees come. Or some of them from Darwin, you know, they send them there. Uh, so that is the, so this regime actually, uh, that uh, they started to do this uh, on uh, 2001. So 2001 is a very important uh, time in history of Australia. It's not only about refugees, because it is the time that uh, John Howard, the Prime Minister of Australia, stand up in the parliament and, they say, and he said that we decide who come to this country. And that was a political shift in Australia that had impact on Australia for at least two decades. So it's very important. So what's happened on that time, on 2001, a group of refugees went to Australia, and that became like a big issue. If you Google it and search about it, is a, they call it Tampa, Tampa ship. So Tampa was the name of a, a, a Norwegian, uh, Ship. When the refugees went to Australia, they stopped them. And then that Tampa ship, the captain decided to uh, accept those uh, uh, refugees. So he uh, actually stopped his ship and started to just support those refugees. And that became a political, like a battle, or because it was close to the election. So that was the time that actually they established this regime to banish refugees. So they did it. Finally, some of those refugees accepted by New Zealand, and some of them, they sent them to Nauru and Manus Island, so they established this. So uh, then on 2007, they closed that camp, and they started again on 2012. They sent another group of refugees to Manus and Nauru, and then they did it on 2013 that I was among those people. So that is the history of uh, this, uh, I call it, exile policy. And they call it offshore processing center. That means they should process people, uh, process their cases, but actually, the, that was a place, it was a exile place, it was a cage, it was a, a prison. So that is the whole uh, story about the image about this uh, policy. But another thing I think is important, that when we look at this policy, we should, uh, you know, analyze it from different uh, perspective, different aspect. So the most important thing about this policy is the how this policy established on uh, colonialism mentality in Australia. And I call it even a classic version of colonialism because they obviously used those islands as a land of exile, as a place to torture people, and uh, 
actually in a way they do it that it seems that indigenous people or local people are not living there. It's like a, that mindset that no one lives there, so we just send refugees there. But people live there. 40,000 people in Manus, and uh, people in Nauru. Uh, so that is the uh, like a pattern in history of Australia that just repeat itself. But of course, that is they done that on indigenous people, on Aboriginal people in Australia. And uh, uh, I myself, when I was in Manus Island at, at the first day, uh, I started to think about it, you know. And I was, it was quite shocking because we didn't have an idea about Manus Island, you know. And uh, I uh, started to think about it and uh, just do a, like a research, like by asking from local people there, and I started to know more about this regime. And uh, I actually always say that the reason that I could stand up and fight against that system, one of the reasons was the main reasons that I was confident enough to start to work, start to write, to expose that system and fight against it was the resistance knowledge in Australia that created by Aboriginal people. So I can say that I as a Kurdish, as a Kurd, in one way I rely on Kurdistan resistance knowledge that we have it in Kurdistan that uh, is become a part of our music, our culture, our poetry, our literature, and political culture, that I reproduce that in that island. And also, the resistance knowledge in Australia, that I was aware of it, or I became aware of it, and that gave me that confidence. So, uh, that is really important that we really cannot understand this system without recognizing that uh, history of colonialism in Australia and that colonialism mentality in Australia still is going on, still continue. That we know that recently they had a uh, referendum uh, and uh, that referendum, the outcome was against uh, Aboriginal people. So that is really important. So what's happened in Manus Island? Uh, so when we want to understand this, we should become uh, be aware of that. We should recognize that colonialism and uh, try to understand it. I mean that we should understand it in that context. Uh, and also the way they treat indigenous people there in Manus Island and Nauru. Uh, that is, I, I think, is really uh, important. And that happened in UK as well. We know that the way they do it in with uh, Rwanda uh, people. So another thing about this policy is really uh, uh, that important. That uh, is. Uh, a dehumanization process. So they couldn't do this without the process of dehumanization. And this process of dehumanization against refugees uh, already happened in the media by the politician. And the language they use to describe refugees the concept of both people, I think that's that start from the both people. When they call you both people, uh, and they repeat it in the media for ages, and that became like a part of like a heart of that propaganda against refugees. That I think uh, is a word that now in Australia, when you say both people, people. Uh, uh, understand it in a different way, you know. 
they think that uh, they understand it alongside uh, like a, a threat against national security that is it's very important because the, this regime established on national security and also uh, many words that they used about us like uh, the drug dealers i don't know potential terrorists or this kind of words but the main process of uh, dehumanization happened inside the prison camp that we were. That we uh, daily were facing that. So already that happened in the media by the politician. That's why they could do it. You know, uh, even in, like in a genocide in history, if you look, before that genocide happened, the process of dehumanization happen. When people start to see you less, that means it's easier for them to do this kind of uh, policy and tragedy. And, uh, but in the, our daily life in, inside the prison camp, uh, so we were 900 men, we were in four separate cages. So just imagine a, a football ground or a, that you just cut it to four cages. So we could see each other or hear each other, but we couldn't like even talk to each other, you know? We were separate, four cages. We were living there in a real cage. And uh, in that system, actually, uh, uh, so I was there uh, that for like six years and two months. We were in that island and they closed it on 2019. Uh, it's really important that that system has some elements. The biggest thing about this is the place that they banished us is far. The journalists, I don't know, the activist is quite not impossible but it's very difficult to reach to that place you know and that was uh, that means that they established this to make us like out of sight and out of mind so they were they established like a prison and a system that we daily, every day, every moment, we had to struggle, you know? And no one could hear us because we were far. And even at the beginning, people were not uh, aware of those prison camps, you know? We started to fight against it and slowly people uh, hear us. And it took a long time, actually. So this system that we are talking about, that I and my colleague Omi Tofifian, who translated uh, No Front But the Mountains, my book, and then uh, the second book that this year we published, uh, that we work on it, we use the, a concept to analyze it. We use the concept is a hierarchical system. Hierarchical system I can say it's a system of control. It's very simple if I uh, describe it. Chirical system, it means system of control. So inside the prison camp, in those years, they designed it in a way that we always, in each moment, even when we were sleeping, even in our nightmare, we had to feel that we are controlled. And how they did it, at the beginning, many guards were in the prison. So, uh, like, a, you just imagine a, like a football ground that we were in the prison camp that I was. We were 400 people, and just imagine like 50 guards were everywhere 
and then they develop it and they brought the camera. So the camera were everywhere. So we always felt that we are under control. So that means that even for one second, we didn't feel uh, freedom, even inside the prison camp. And it's quite interesting, the most, I call it the freest part of space in that prison were the toilets, you know? Uh, that in the toilet was the only place that we could have some space. And, uh, uh, but still, they, uh, you know, some guards were around. So even inside the toilets, you could feel that they are watching you, you know. And another thing is uh, that they uh, call us by number. So it's easy that people call you by a number and you accept it for a week or 10 days, but not for six years. So when you call you by number for many years, that means uh, they, that you are losing your identity. You know, and that is a part of process of dehumanization. Uh, and also the way they design the system to humiliate us. Because we had to stay in the line to get food for hours. That I describe in the book. Uh, we had to stay in the line under sun for hours to get breakfast or lunch or dinner. But the main part of this system actually was medical uh, like system. That the company was working their uh, IHMS. That this medical system was designed in a way that refugees who were sick, they never get medical treatment. It was just a system uh, that put people through a like a bureaucratic system and in the end of that they didn't get medical treatment and that's why in Manus Island eight people were killed and most of them because of medical neglect. And in Nauru people, uh, six people. So 14 people in the end killed only in those two islands. So I mean, it was a very uh, complicated system, bureaucratic system that we, uh, uh, you know, uh, we use the concept critical system to analyze it, to understand it. And also uh, that uh, that concept that I mentioned, I said national security. I think that is important as well. Uh, when they, uh, uh, I don't know the how long I talk so far. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that national security is important. Because the way they establish this policy on based of national security, that means we refugees there, we couldn't have access to uh, like uh, court system. And even if we would have access, we over the always the government was the winner because they could justify that we are doing this, we are uh, breaking, uh, violating human rights because of national security. So always they could justify that. So I can't say that we were out of law, but in the same time we were victim of law. So that national security is really important concept. And uh, we know that in UK exactly they are going to do that. So I mean that this policy has many uh, 
uh, liars. So, but the main uh, conversation that we can have that was just uh, like a context is about uh, uh, writing. You know, the title of this event is writing as an act of uh, resistance. I think that is really important. That when we have a system like that, that is a system of control, that you always feel that you are under watch, you are always, even you have, if you had a small infection, you could feel death. <laughs> Because the, always we could feel death. In each moment, we could feel that, you know. So in that system, that system of control, that I call it systematic torture, uh, writing, for me, and for others, I know that other refugees wrote a lot as well, I mean, the best way, the most powerful way to challenge that system is to be creative. So to be creative is not necessary means that you should write. For me, it was writing. But for others, for many, even relying on nature, I don't know, create a small garden in, inside the prison camp, in the corner of the prison camp, or even for some people uh, being funny, using humor, uh, sharing stories, uh, dancing, music, singing, and performance <coughs> in any way, is an act of resistance because you are creative against that system. That means when you are creative, means that you create a space for yourself as a detainee to feel freedom even inside the prison camp, to feel even for a moment that you are not under watch, you are not under control. And also, for me, writing, uh, I, actually I forgot to mention the, actually the way I smuggled the phone into the prison camp. Yeah, I think that was quite big, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, so we, uh, I collected cigarettes, but uh, that's quite interesting. In all of those years, they always they gave us cigarette, and they use it as a inside the prison camp. We use it as a, like currency. So cigarette was our currency. Uh, that I collected uh, some cigarettes and through a local officer who was working inside the camp. I uh, smuggled the phone in and I started to uh, communicate with people uh, and for two years I was just working as an unknown source because I didn't feel safe in front of the system, in front of the authorities. And then after two years, when I became sure that I have a, like a network out of the prison, and I had some good friends or uh, good c contacts, like the Ben Doherty who was working for Guardian, uh, when I became sure that I, there is a network, and if something happened for me, uh, there, there are people who know me. I started to publish my work, my article, which most of them, or all of them, were opinion pieces uh, under my name. And then through, I work first with uh, uh, Munes Mansubi, and then uh, later on with uh, Omid Tofikian and then with Omid we just developed this work 
and uh, then later, uh, you know, making a film. So that's just I started to publish my works. But uh, I think writing for me is uh, uh, so. In that context, I think we should understand in this way. Anything that we did in that island was an act of, uh, a political act, you know, because anything that we did to challenge that system, to expose it, that was a political act. Because uh, the politicians in Australia, the both major parties, they were in like a competition to use us as a, like political tools. And that is a pattern in history of federal elections since 2001. That always a month or two months or three months before the election, something big happened for refugees. So in Manus Island, we stand up against that. And in the end, after six years, I can say that we created a, a body of work uh, and I call it uh, resistance knowledge. And it should be interesting for people who are in a remote island, a tiny island, this huge island, and we were that tiny island. And at the beginning, this island, for the politician here, they dehumanized us, no one cared about us, but in the end, after six years, we created a body of work. We challenged this system. We challenged this huge uh, country because we were uh, watching Australia from our prison for six years. And we created a body of work. Not only me, many refugees. We created music, we created a, a lot of painting, artwork, books, film. And now we have that. And I think I call it the resistance knowledge. That knowledge is important, and it should be important, because that knowledge created by people who were watching this huge uh, island from that tiny island. And that should be unique. And it seemed, it's scary as well, you know? Because that knowledge we created there, in, inside the prison camp. So, uh, I just, I want to just show some of this work that just you have an idea about this works, but uh, if you go and Google, uh, you see that uh, it's like a, a body of work, is a big uh, work that uh, we created. And the people of Australia, some uh, part of Australia, like people like Omi Tofikian and Munes Mansubi, who work with us, uh, we created this knowledge together. Refugees and that part of civil society in Australia. So if, uh, for example, just, uh, so this uh, my first book, No Friend About the Mountain, uh, that uh, is more like a literary language. And I, then uh, this book we published this year is uh, like a collection of my articles, but not all of them, some of them, like 42 or three articles. Uh, uh, publishing this book and uh, alongside some other people that we uh, that I had the chance to work with them, like Ben Doherty, the uh, journalist from Guardian, that he was one of the first people that we worked together. So he wrote an article and published here. Omid did and Munis did. So that's uh, these two books. Uh, uh, but, you know, the, the second book, I like it more, I think. <laughs> yeah, people are not angry with me, but uh, because this is a like, kind of uh, journalism uh, that is quite uh, different with uh, the normal uh, journalism that we know, because 
the journalism language now is more rely on official language, but this is uh, just from my perspective as a detainee. So if we go to the next, and yeah, yeah, and this is the film, uh, Chalk of Pleistolos Time. That this film I made it with uh, Arash Kamori Sarvastani, who is in Netherlands. And we made this film in 2017 uh, and, uh, uh, with my phone. And uh, on that time was quite different. We had more, uh, actually, the, we pushed the prison back, you know. Uh, so because it's six years, these six years were not the same. It was just changing. Uh, for example, the first six months, even we couldn't listen to music. You know, but like after six months, we forced them that we uh, we smuggled the uh, MP3 players into the prison and we started to listen. They attacked us, they took it, but in the end, they just accept that we listen to music. So this film is a Choco Pristal at the time. It's an important film, actually. Uh, uh, I can't say that I like this more than the books. <laughs> Yeah, because in this uh, film, actually, uh, it's not only about refugees. We, I and Arash, we included Manusian people in this film. And we created uh, the space for them to show their anger. Because uh, in that humanitarian organizations or the media, mostly they just talk about refugees. But in my work, I try to include the Manusian people as well, because they were victim under that policy as well. You know, in the book, we, I have just some particular article about them, and in the film, mostly we have the local people that they talk. And it's quite uh, interesting, we can uh, talk about this if you have time, about the film, about the story of the film, and what is Choka means, what, what is Choka. Uh, if we go to the next one. Yeah, this is uh, like a play that uh, uh, made by uh, Nazanin Samizadeh. Uh, she's Iranian, actually. And uh, she just... Uh, made this play and, you know, later become like many festivals. And if we go to the next. Uh, yeah, this is another work that we did it in uh, uh, 2018. So this is a, a video installation that now is in the museum. As Iran, Madam, as a son Iran, وقتی که ایران اومدم 19 سالم بود به مدت 5 سال در جزیره مانوسم الان 24 سالمه کرد هستم استیتلس من آری سیروان هستم 26 سالمه موقعی که ما به مانوس اومدم 21 سالم بود از ایران اومدم استان کرد نشین ایلام من کرد فردی هم استیتلس uh, yeah, so this is the, like a video installation that which uh, include the uh, photos uh, by uh, Hoda Afshar, who is an um, Australian uh, photographer. Yeah, this film is uh, stopped about, it's just a documentary made by Simon Kurian. And, uh, you know, I just took some shots for him that he used in this film. But actually the film, I think is a very good film for people who want to and uh, know uh, like a general uh, information about this policy. And yeah, it's uh, quite an interesting film that made in Australia. Uh, but there are many works actually, just they are just some of them. For example, uh, you know, last year we published a <coughs> journal that we uh, yeah, we have some, uh, we like writing by uh, refugees, like 90 refugees contributed to that journal alongside uh, some indigenous 
writers uh, in Australia. So we link these two, uh, you know, uh, Manus with uh, uh, indigenous people and indigenous uh, writers in Australia, and also a play, another play that is about uh, Aboriginal people who uh, die or kill in the custody in Australia, that we link it with uh, Manus. And some other works, a lot, there are many works if you are interested and you just Google about it, there are uh, enough material. Just one thing I should say is quite interesting, that these days we are living in the age of internet, but uh, you know, people think, uh, you know, in Australia there was a referendum and the campaign, uh, the no campaign against that, uh, they said, I don't know, and that's why I said no. And they, that campaign uh, won, actually. So that is a stupid. In the age of internet, people say, I don't know what this referendum is about. I mean, that is complex and I don't understand it. That's why I say no. That means I'm lazy, that means I'm, I don't know, stupid, that means I don't want to understand, that means, you know, I don't want to research about it. We are living in this world is crazy sometimes. I don't know, that's why I say no, you know. In Australia, I see people, they say that, oh, we know nothing about Manus and Lord. I say, we have this work, we've been working hard, so hard for six years, just take some moments and look at it. So I'm talking about Australians, actually. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Side is the ocean, the jungle. That is the freedom there, I think. Free the refugees! Free, 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 free the Piss off your lefty scum. Go home, the lefty. Piss off your lefty Go scum. What do you want? Freedom! What do you want? Freedom! What do you want? Freedom!